Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about how to handle name changes in your family tree. And I'm talking about how to record them, why they happen, and where we might find some of that information, not how to handle it emotionally. <laughs> I, I realize maybe I titled that a little bit awkwardly. So um, we've got a lot to cover and not a lot of time. Uh, just as a note for those of you who are watching this live, I do have another commitment immediately following this presentation today. So I will not be available on live chat like I typically am after our broadcasts. However, you can join me tomorrow. That's Friday. The date tomorrow, what is the date tomorrow? The date is the 5th, Friday the 5th of April um, at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be doing a live tweet chat, so if you have genealogy questions and want to join me there, the uh, URL is tweetchat.com forward slash acom chat. Um, you can find us there. You can either follow along and learn some things there, or you can ask questions if you have a Twitter account. If you don't have a Twitter account, you're still welcome to join us there. Um, I'm sure other people will ask questions that will um, provide you information to learn about some new resources and maybe some new tips and tricks for solving your own genealogy problems. So again, that URL is tweetchat.com forward slash acom chat. That will be tomorrow morning, April 5th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, which is 8 a.m. Pacific. So hopefully you'll join me there. Let's dive into today's topic. Um, as I said, we we're going to talk about how to handle name changes in your family tree. So let's just start with a brief discussion about why name changes occur. And it's important to understand the why so that um, you know um, maybe what it is that you're looking for or what it is that you're looking at. One of the reasons, one of the main reasons, especially here in the United States, why name changes occur is because people had a desire for a less ethnic name. And that ethnic name may have been Eastern European, that ethnic name may have been Italian, that ethnic name may have even been Irish. It just, it just depends. It depends on the time period. It depends on the sentiment um, here in the United States at that time toward people um, of that nationality. It also just depends on their community, um, whether they felt, and, and the individual, whether they felt they could get a better job if they were John Smith, um, in, or you know, whether, you, lots of reasons, right? And so there's lots of ways that that, um, that ethnic um, alteration of that name occurs. One of my um, favorite examples is an Italian man named Giuseppe Blanco who became Joe White. <laughs> Right? And that was just a, a straight translation of his name. His, his name Giuseppe means Joseph in English. His name Blanco means white in English. And so he became Joe White. Sometimes it's a matter of um, dropping, a, dropping a, a suffix on their name. So a McCuskey became a McKay, right? Not Scottish, <laughs> uh, actually Polish, but that just by dropping off that suffix and Americanizing the pronunciation a little bit, um, they appeared less of an ethnicity that they might want have not wanted to have been associated with um, or just a matter of becoming more Americanized. That was something that many people desired. Another reason why name changes occur, and these aren't really name changes, but sometimes they confuse us in the records, and so I wanted to make sure I addressed it, um, has, has to do with nicknames. So I have a lot of family in the South, and besides alternately going by their first or middle name, depending on the time period and who else was living with them and any other number of reasons they could have at any time been going by either a given name or a middle name. Um, there also are a lot of nicknames. As a matter of fact, my, um, my grandmother um, is, comes from a very large family and her father gave each of his children and his grandchildren nicknames. And some of those nicknames stuck and those nicknames became how they were known throughout the whole family. And so, for example, when we talk about my uncle Corky, um, you know, if I hadn't spent some time with the family records, I may have never known what his actual name was because that was, that was what he was called. That was what he was called by everybody we associated with. And sometimes those nicknames find their ways into official records. You know, if, if I was telling a census taker, here are the people that live in my household, and I always call a family member by a certain nickname, that may just come out, um, even though, you know, I might be asked for an official set of information. So just be aware that it's not a formal name change issue, but nicknames 
will creep up and uh, they're a part of the family story and they may also help you find more records and so we need a way to keep track of those. Another reason why name changes occur, and this is probably going to be one of the most difficult situations, because the people changed their name for the purpose of hiding. Um, they were trying to hide maybe from the government, maybe from a wife who wouldn't give them a divorce and they wanted to move on. Maybe they're trying to hide from debt. Maybe they're, you know, I mean, there's any number of reasons why people may have gone into hiding and changed their name for that purpose. The problem is, is that then they're hiding from us as well, you know, decades, centuries later as we're trying to track them down. So uh, that does occur, but it also means that finding um, the real information about either their subsequent name or their previous name, depending on which direction you're coming at it from, might be a little bit more challenging. Not impossible, just a little bit more challenging. And then um, uh, the final reason here for why people typically change their names uh, and of course this is not an exhaustive lost list but these are the most common reasons uh, are religious reasons and sometimes this isn't so much as of a name change as it is as a, of a name addition so for example um, a lot of families that migrated out of eastern europe not only would they have a russian name and then you know, an Americanized version of that name that usually just starts with the same first letter. It's not even a, a translation or uh, you know, an Americanization of the name so much as it is they just took the first letter of their name and picked a name that sounds American that starts with the same letter. But then they also would have a Hebrew name. And so in church records and on tombstones, they would be recorded with that Hebrew name and not with their American name. So it's not really a name change so much as it is just an additional name. Um, same thing in some religions, um, you know, in Catholicism and in, and in the Lutheran faith and, and some other religions where upon baptism or upon confirmation, depending on the rites of the particular religion, they may get an additional name. And sometimes that then shows up on official records. Very rarely is that religious name a name that they're just going to use um, on government records or in casual conversation, but when they're recording their formal name, you know, on a marriage record or on a tombstone, they may include that religious name as part of their full name. So it's just, just keep all these things in mind because you're going to find that sometimes you have ancestors whose names are recorded a variety of ways. And we haven't even touched the subject yet of all the different variations of a particular name. So even if the name wasn't really changed, there may have been a variety of spelling um, variations of either the given name or the surname. Now let's talk about where these name changes typically occur. And I, I um, mentioned some of them as we talked about the whys up here, but let's talk about just a couple of wheres because this will help you start to think about where, where you can find records or where you might not find records. The first where is actually a negative. Names were not changed at Ellis Island. Um, I can't tell you how many people have a story in their family history that somebody's name was changed at Ellis Island. And that is a myth that I am not sure why it perpetuates. Let me tell you why that it, briefly, I've discussed this before, but let me tell you briefly why that's a myth. First of all, passenger lists were typically created when people got on the ship, not when they got off the ship. And so those passenger lists would have been created at their port of embarkation, um, typically by people who spoke the same language as them. So it wasn't a matter of not understanding them or of recording the name, you know, inaccurately because of whatever reason, right? So that doesn't mean your, your ancestor's name might not be a little misspelled or that it might not have been written so sloppy that the indexer couldn't transcribe it correctly. Um, it doesn't even preclude the rare occasion when people actually sailed using somebody else's ticket, okay? But the name was not changed at Ellis Island. When they got to Ellis Island, the passenger list was already written, and Ellis Island had clerks who spoke almost every single language that was represented by the immigrants coming into this country. So what, that, what happens though typically is people came into this country and very quickly started using an Americanized version of their name. And so look for census records. Um, and those, 
you know, the first census after they come to the country, they might be listed by their original name. Uh, and then the subsequent censuses, their names might be more Americanized. Or sometimes the reverse. That first census, they may have been listed by their Americanized version of their name. And then subsequently, they may have felt more comfortable um, with their true identity or with their original name. And so they may have used that. So just be aware that sometimes you will see that flip-flop on census records. There is also a formal process of name change. Many immigrants who wanted to formally change their name would do it as part of their naturalization process. And so maybe their declaration of intent was filed with their birth name, and then the um, second papers were filed with their Americanized version of their name. Or there is actually a form that you might sometimes see in that naturalization packet that is an official name change form. So it would list the name that they came into this country under for the purposes of verifying their arrival on a passenger list, and then the name that they have been going by since they have been in this country. So look for that if, um, always, always with your immigrant ancestors, look for that naturalization packet and make sure you get all of the documents in that packet, not just the certificate of naturalization. Also, if, if there was a formal name change that occurred, and, and typically it's not going to be people who are going into hiding, but um, if there was a formal name change that occurred, it may have been handled by a local courthouse. So even if they didn't naturalize, or if they decided to officially change their name after naturalization, they may have gone to a local courthouse to do that. And so you would probably need to contact the local courthouse where they lived to get that kind of documentation. If it's informal, like I said, just follow the paper trail, right? Just even when you have every single member of a family whose names have been Americanized, sometimes you can tell just by gender and ages and birth locations and immigration years, you can tell that this family is still your family. So don't just pay attention to names. Don't make names the sole indicator of whether or not you have the right family. If, if, if you have an Americanized version of a surname and they have all different first names, check out the genders, check out the ages, look at where each of those children were born. Were some of them born in the old country and some of them born in the new country? Does the immigration year match some of that other documentation? And remember, like I said earlier, sometimes they would use their Americanized version in those first records when they came to this country and then later be more comfortable using their um, original ethnic names and sometimes they would do it the other way around. So just be aware that there are some of those um, changes that occur, but follow that paper trail. Um, and that's no different than how we do all genealogy, right? We're always following the paper trail, making sure that we get all the records we can about all the members of the family, not just the one ancestor that we descend through, because all of the family members might have additional clues. Um, you know, maybe a sibling recorded their mother's birth name on their death certificate, whereas all the other siblings just recorded her, the Americanized version of her name. So just keep that in mind and make sure you're researching complete families. Now, let's talk about how to keep track of some of these name changes and variations. I'm just gonna walk really quickly through where in Family Tree Maker and where in your online ancestry.com tree, so if you have either or both of those, where you can keep track of some of these name changes and variations. In Family Tree Maker, uh, you're going to want to add a fact, and there are uh, a couple of different ways you can do that. There is a fact already built into Family Tree Maker and Ancestry.com trees called Also Known As. Um, I use Also Known As for things like nicknames or, um, well, mostly just nicknames. There is also then the ability to add another name and make it an alternate. So you have to make one of the names preferred and then any other or subsequent name alternate. And you can add several of those. So I use alternate then, an alternate name for actual name changes and also known as for nicknames. And I keep track of those things um, because I want to make sure that I have all of those search parameters. Also because, um, well, it's just, it's the full family story, right? So here is my Uncle Carl. Uncle Carl is the my grandmother's younger brother who went by Corky his whole life, right? So his name is actually Carl. It's here, here's his name, Carl M. Kerr, right? But I can come up here and I can add a fact. And the fact that uh, and the fact that I'm going to add is also known as. They're alphabet, these facts are alphabetical. 
So I can click on that, and then over here I can just type in Corky Kerr. Um, and that was his that was his nickname. That was what he was also known as, right? And so now it shows up here. Um, here is his name. Here is his nickname, okay? I could, if he had actually changed his name, and he didn't in this case, but I could come here and add an additional name, and I could put in a whole separate name. And now here are two names, but one of them is listed as preferred. Okay, so that's how you do that. Um, just on the person tab, you come here and you add facts and your options are also known as, and then scroll down here, you also have a fact of name, okay? You can also add facts, like if you don't like the phrase also known as, you can add a fact called nickname. It's up to you, um, fully customizable, but I tend to stick with the facts that already exist, so that's how I do it. Um, on Ancestry.com, um, you actually, instead of just clicking on add a fact and then having a choice of one of those two things, there's actually two different screens where you can do this. Um, both are under the edit option, and I'll show them to you so you don't have to remember this right this second, but both are under the edit option. One is called more options, and then you add an alternate name, and one is the facts and events tab and you add an also known as. So here's what that looks like. So I'm here on a person in my tree. I'm gonna click edit this person. And here's the name. This is the preferred name. I can come over here to more options and I can add an alternate name. So here, this is my great grandfather. Um, his alternate name is Edmund. Right, so there are we have official documents where his name is listed as Walter Edmund, and we also have official documents where his name is listed as Walter Edward. And so, if I can't prove definitively which one is his name, if he used both, then both are his name, right? And then I just have to decide which one I want to either to make preferred or not. And now, when I save that, um, I have this additional name here, right. So now I have both names listed, and one is listed as an alternate. So that's for, again, name changes. Now if you want to add a nickname, or an also known as, click on this Facts and Events tab. I can add a new event, and we have the same events that we have in Family Tree Maker, this one in particular being an also known as, and I can add that information then here. So all of that is just a way to keep track of these name alternation, these name alterations, name changes, nicknames, anything that you could possibly want to search on, it allows you to keep track of all of that information. Now I'm gonna make one final suggestion, and this probably is the most important suggestion uh, of the whole presentation, so hopefully you're still with me. Um, always, 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 I only wrote it once, but I'm gonna emphasize it more, always, <laughs> make notes about your name changes and variations. If you have um, a name, particularly with spellings, if your ancestor may have spelled their name three or four different ways consistently, you can add each one of those as an alternate name if you choose. But when it's just a spelling variation, typically I will just go into the notes and make a note that just says spelling variations for this name include, and then list what those surname spelling variations are. Sometimes that's a little bit more effective um, and a little bit less cluttery, but it, but it also helps you connect with where you may have found some of those variations. Because then in my notes, as I transcribe the records I'm finding, you know, in this census it was spelled this way, in this military record it was spelled this way, I start to list some of those things so that I can see, did the name change over time? Did it morph over time? Or was it just kind of all over the place, flip-flopping back and forth between various spellings and usage, right? So I was working on a family last night where their last name was Brown, B-R-O-W-N. And then in some records I was finding it was B-R-O-W-N-E. Well, once I laid out all those records in my notes, I just, you know, I, I realized that there was actually a point in time right around the 1880 census. Before that, it had been consistently brown without the E, and after that, it was consistently brown with the E in every record I found. So there was some kind of a decision or a conscious choice made there 
to actually change the spelling of the name as opposed to just it being misread or miswritten or, you know, spelling's not that important, whatever. So when you make notes, it helps you see some of those places in which or times in which those names may have been changed. If you're not familiar with how to use your notes feature, um, let me just give you a quick view here. When you're uh, in your family tree, you have the option here to add a note under more options. I would strongly encourage you to get used to using that. Um, just to, for your own sanity, <laughs> um, I my tree is synced to uh, Ancestry.com, so I actually do all of my work here in Family Tree Maker, and in Family Tree Maker, my notes feature is over here, and you can see I actually use them very heavily. I transcribe things so that I can see, right? Here's his name consistently, Albert, Albert, Albert. Um, he has a middle initial here. His full name is listed here, right? I can just skim through those notes and get a really good picture of their life. Um, I can see what changes occur, what information is consistent or inconsistent. I also, you may notice here, bold information where I still have further research that I need to do. So I use the notes feature very heavily. It helps me maintain my sanity. It also makes sure that I'm documenting for my own purposes the information that I'm finding so that I know where to go next, what to find next. People change their names all the time. Um, immigrants change their name. People who were born and died here in the United States may have changed their name. There are nicknames, there are religious names, um, lots of different variations in spelling and changes. The key point here, of course, is just make sure that you document them. Know where those name changes or alternates are used so that you know where to go next and how to tell your family story. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.